In 1941, Rudolf Hess, the deputy Führer, and thus the second most important man in Germany, set off on a one-man mission to, at least in his eyes, save the world. He wouldn't ever see freedom again, and would remain in Allied captivity until the day he died, in 1987, at the age of 93. This episode of the war is sorely under-discussed. Maybe it's because it goes against the general good versus bad narrative, as it showed the extent leading Germans were willing to go to to secure peace. Maybe because of the shameful treatment of Hess when he was imprisoned. Even many on the Allied side agree with this, given there was a movement in Parliament to free him from prison, and many other movements that never resulted in anything. A lot of the time, it's just dismissed as him being insane. Although there is some truth to him being mentally ill, he wasn't insane. There was more to this story than we are told. Let's find out the truth. Before we begin, as always, I'd like to thank my patrons for the incredible support. Without them, these videos wouldn't be possible. You have no idea how much the donations help the channel, even the $2 tier. So if you do have some spare dollars lying around, and you enjoy these videos, please consider supporting me on my Patreon. You can gain access to the Patreon Discord, Telegram, and the new weekly Hearts of Iron 4 games we will be hosting, as well as me creating a video of your choice. In 1940, France fell, and as the quote goes, Britain stood alone, albeit with the Empire and masses of American aid. This should have been the end of it, at least, that's what the Germans thought. Wasn't it only logical that Britain came to terms? Poland, the reason for the war, had fallen almost a year earlier. France, their main ally, vanquished in weeks. Scandinavia, where the Brits, at Churchill's urging, had planned to intervene but got beaten by the punch by Hitler when their plans were discovered, had fallen in weeks also and collaboration was rife. All of the conquered nations, for the most part, just wanted the Brits to call it a day so they could go back to their lives. This wasn't the attitude in London or Washington, however, albeit only in the minds of the heads of state. Roosevelt in Washington had tried paying the French off to keep fighting as Paris was about to fall, even threatening them not to, and when they capitulated, he froze their assets. The British Empire was being stripped dry as Roosevelt brought it up for pennies on the dollar to give the Brits their much-needed aid. This was entirely in his interest. America is the world hegemon now, largely as a result of this transfer of power. In London, Churchill immediately set to work making sure the war carried on. His whole life, he just wanted to get into the thick of it and fight. Consequences be damned. He'd pushed hard for the First World War, and then pushed even harder for the Second, resulting in millions of dead. Now that Britain was staring defeat in the face, he didn't change his tune. Huge peace movements were growing. After all, what was the aim of fighting? What could Britain gain? Those with foresight knew fighting on would ruin the economy and lose the empire. There were demonstrations outside Number 10. There was no barriers in those days. They were right outside Churchill's window. Oswald Mosley was locked up and the key thrown away, the champion of the British peace movement at the time. Escalation was the next move and Churchill needed only one thing to keep the British people wanting to fight, bombs landing on their heads. So far, the general agreement was to avoid bombing civilian targets. Apart from a few small raids in the Rhineland, the Brits stuck to it. Germany also stuck to it, despite much opposition, but Hitler would not budge. He loved the British people. He had no interest in killing them or fighting them. After a German bomber missed its target and hit London, killing or wounding no one, Churchill snatched at his chance. Despite the warnings from Bomber Command, he ordered a hundred strong bomber attack on Berlin. Hitler didn't reply. Berlin was struck again. Raid after raid followed until finally, Hitler's patience ran out. He was furious by this point. He reluctantly ordered the bombing of British cities in return. The British civilians, although dragged in by their own Prime Minister, but obviously not to their knowledge, were now in the fight. British stoicism was ramped up to the maximum, and they were willing to endure whatever to take the fight to the Germans. It was now total war, and civilians were legitimate targets. Hitler wanted none of this. He approached Hess, whom he had made his second in line to succeed him immediately before the war had kicked off, and discussed things with him. He asked Hess if he had a way of contacting his friends in England to bring an end to the madness. They hadn't seen much of each other lately with the war going on, but Hess was still eternally loyal to Hitler. When Hitler was in Landsberg prison, Hess willingly came out of hiding to join him in there. He helped him write Mein Kampf, he was there for him every step of the way. He took his mission, and ran with it further than the Führer could have possibly intended. When Hitler mentioned Hess's friends in England, he actually meant Scotland. The Duke of Hamilton was well known to Hess, although he would try to deny it and make later events seem even more absurd than they were. They had met at the 1936 Berlin Olympics and stayed in touch. A signed picture of Hamilton to Hess was found after the war, from 1938, and they had corresponded frequently between 1936 and 1939. This was Hess's route to the King. The King of England hated Churchill and found him a vile warmonger. The Queen had even at points discussed being rid of Churchill with some admirals loyal to the Crown, but nothing came of it. If Hess could just get their side of things through to the king, then this crazy war could be brought to an end. When he arrived in England, there would be a sealed letter to the king in Hess's pocket. Hess's confidants, father and son duo Karl and Elbrecht Haushofer, who were to help him set up the mission, were extremely sceptical, but helped nonetheless. 
Albrecht wrote to an intermediary, a Mrs. Roberts in Lisbon, Portugal, to get the message to either the Duke of Hamilton or General Sir Ian Hamilton, although the latter was 87. Hess talked to the Haushoffers of how the continuance of the war would be a disaster for the white race, and that even with the complete takeover of Europe, Germany was not in a position to inherit the British Empire. Hitler, and by extension Hess, wanted, and had always wanted, an alliance with Great Britain, not war. They loved the empire, perhaps wrongly given their hatred for international capitalism, but regardless, they loved the British people and saw them as extremely similar to the Germans. There was no sense in war. The younger Haushofer sent a letter to his father explaining the ridiculousness of this plan. It read, Let us suppose that the case were reversed. An old lady in Germany receives a letter from an unknown source abroad with the request to forward a message whose recipient is asked to disclose to an unknown foreigner where he will be staying for a certain period, and this recipient were a high officer in the Air Force. I do not think that you need imagination to picture to yourself the faces that Canaris and Heydrich would make, and the smirk with which they would consider any offer of security or confidence in such a letter if a subordinate should submit such a case to them. He was right. They wrote to Mrs. Roberts in Lisbon, but it came to nothing. Hess sent Albrecht to Geneva to discuss peace with the president of the Swiss Red Cross, but as history shows, these came to nothing also. No terms would ever be good enough for the Brits. The Germans offered to guarantee the British Empire, even offering troops to defend it were it to be attacked. They would lose nothing, but they were dealing with Churchill, perhaps the biggest warmonger these islands have ever seen. There was no logic to be had on Downing Street. Hess admired the Duke of Hamilton greatly. He had flown the first flight over Mount Everest, which they spoke of when they met at the 1936 Olympics. Hess loved flying. This was his kind of man. He wanted to fly the first solo flight from Germany to the US after the First World War, but after a year of preparation, it was abandoned. In September 1939, as soon as war broke out, Hess asked Hitler to join the Luftwaffe. He was declined, being seen as too important to Hitler, so Hess gave his word that he would not fly a plane for a year. When the year was up though, he began quietly flying again without reminding the Fuhrer that the duration of the ban had ended. Hess wasn't put off his mission by the failure to make contact so far. This assignment meant the world to him. Hess greatly respected the British. After all, he was born in British Egypt and grew up there. In 1936, Hess had been diagnosed with latent paranoid schizophrenia by his doctor. Looking at some of the older footage of Hess, you can see this. There's always a kind of inhuman devotion to Hitler in his eyes. The news was kept secret, of course. The deputy Fuhrer being a schizo isn't the best look. Anyway, this is relevant because ever since the bombing of civilians began, he had been having visions and nightmares tormenting him. He recalled later to a Brit questioning him in captivity. In my mind's eye, I kept seeing in Germany and Britain alike a line of children's coffins with weeping mothers standing behind them. And then again, the coffins of mothers with their children stood behind them. The visions wouldn't go away, and in his mind developed a need to fulfil the Fuhrer's task of reaching out to secure peace, but he took it to the extremes that Hitler never imagined. The idea developed over time in Hess's head of making a flight to Scotland to the Duke himself. If it came off, he would be the champion of peace. He would have saved millions of lives. If he didn't, he would tell the Fuhrer in a letter beforehand to disown him. He was ready to roll the dice if it meant saving all those lives. He began by talking to Willy Messerschmitt. If the name sounds familiar, it's because it is. He was the plane designer. Hess began flying again and took over 20 test flights before the big day. He talked to Willy of aircraft, and Willy assigned someone to help him take his test flights, although obviously told him nothing of the plan. Eventually, Hess would inquire about modifications to the particular aircraft that he was flying, resulting in better radio equipment and fuel storage being fitted to his plane. When asked why he needed these, he fobbed off the questions by saying he potentially had a flight to Norway lined up, but it was a state secret. To Hess's wife, she only knew that he had a secret plan and that he was out preparing for it. In their household, private and public affairs were kept strictly apart, and she liked it that way, so didn't inquire about what he was up to or why he was always so incredibly tense, and where boxes were constantly packed and unpacked. The most odd thing of all was how much time he was suddenly spending with their only son. She says, what caused me more surprise than almost anything else during those last weeks was the astonishing amount of time, and that is, in the middle of the war, that my husband spent with our son. This ran into long hours by the ESA, lengthy visits to the nearby zoo at Hellebron, and mysterious games behind the closed doors of the workroom. All this seemed to me inexplicable in those earnest times. Hess ended up making at least three attempts to reach Britain, as early as January 1941. Each time, a fault developed with the plane, or the weather turned for the worst. One time even giving his adjutant, Pinch, a letter for the Fuhrer, and one for Pinch himself, saying that if he wasn't home in a given time, to open it. The time passed, and he opened it, but Hess returned home, another of his failed attempts. On Saturday the 10th of May, 1941, Hess had tea with his wife, then stood at the door to the nursery, looking very grave and hesitant. 
When asked when he would be back, he replied, perhaps tomorrow, but certainly by Monday. As we know, he wasn't back by Monday. In fact, he didn't see his wife and son again until Christmas Eve 1969, 28 years later, when his son was 32 years old. The visit was limited to half an hour, and they weren't even allowed to touch him, but that's a story for my biography video on Hess, coming in the next two weeks of when this is posted. That night, Hess took off, wearing a Luftwaffe uniform so he couldn't be shot as a spy in Scotland, and this time, didn't return. Hess's adjutant had his schedule. He was to wait until 10.30 that evening, and if Hess did not return, to catch the night train to see Hitler at the Eagle's Nest. Hess's journey took five hours and was the proudest technical achievement of his life. Had the peace offer come off, this would have been one of the most important, incredible, and brave events in the history of the human race. He knew that he could not perform a night landing, so Hess was set on parachuting. At that same time, the biggest raid so far on England was taking place in London, with the mass of available planes focused there. The British were totally distracted, no one cared to bother with the lone plane flying into Scotland. Still, to avoid detection, he began what he calls hedge hopping. According to the Duke of Hamilton, it impressed the English a great deal. Hess said he enjoyed every minute of it. One thing he didn't practice was jumping, and after his 900 mile flight, it almost came to a horrible end. He messed up the jump and the air pressure pinned him to his plane, but right at the last minute, he got himself out. He had escaped death by seconds. He landed only two minutes flying time from the Duke of Hamilton, albeit with a broken ankle. The events that followed are outside the scope of this video, but will be in my full Hess biography. What is worth noting though, is some weird events that we shall never have the answer to, just like many things during the war that we shall never know. Hitler is dead, he cannot tell us. Hess stuck firmly by his version of events until he died under strange circumstances in 1987. Churchill, King George and the Duke of Hamilton are no longer with us. No one involved is. What I've briefly covered in this video is what we know and has been covered. But even David Irving, the historian with the most sources, especially German sources in history, is left puzzled as to why Churchill said, we have intercepted him when Hess was caught. Did he know that he was coming? Why did the Duke of Hamilton not have the plane taken down? It was in his jurisdiction and his men saw the plane coming. Was he in on it? He would deny it to the day he died, but perhaps there is more to it than we know. Why only two days after Hess arrived, did the Duke of Hamilton and the King have lunch? Why wasn't Churchill there? It would have been in the King's benefit to take advantage of the situation and make peace. He wanted nothing to do with Churchill's war. Was he aware that Hess was coming? Or was this just a routine visit due to events? We shall never know the answers to these questions, but people certainly have their theories. Let me know down below. Did Hitler know more than he let on? His reaction surely suggests that he didn't know Hess would go, but maybe that was the plan. Hess did tell Hitler to disown him if things went wrong in his letter, which he duly did. What about the Duke, the King, and Churchill? What did they know that history has not told us? Let's discuss below. I'll be replying to all the comments. What is clear, however, is that Hess desperately wanted peace and that he cared deeply about the British and German people. In his eyes, there was nothing for either side to gain in such a conflict. This wasn't some ploy to let Germany take over the world. Hess genuinely cared. For that, he should be admired by both sides. To history, whilst he hasn't been placed alongside figures like Hitler, Mengele, Dillwanger, or Himmler, he isn't portrayed as a peaceful man, and for the most part, he's lumped in with the rest. This is deeply unfair. After all, he took no part in the war after his flight, where most atrocities that the Nazis are vilified for took place. Perhaps it's time for a rethink of Rudolf Hess's legacy. We will take a proper look next week in my biography video and judge for ourselves. Thank you for watching, and please leave a like if you enjoyed. It helps more than you can imagine. Once again, a huge thank you to my patrons, Lobster to you, Doorway Lololol, Sigmar, Emperor Titus, Luke David Murphy, Chechen Natsok, Cameron, Anton Berglund, Levi E, and Lanza for the incredible support. It quite literally makes these videos possible.